Hello, good morning, and welcome to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I'm Nancy Allspot Jackson. I'm Shannon Penrod. Good morning. Hi, good and welcome. morning to you. We got a lot to do this morning. Yeah, we have a couple of things. There's a lot going on yeah. too. Just a lot happening. Uh, but we've got some in the news. A little bit later on, we're gonna have two amazing guests. Carrie Dunn Barone is gonna be with us. And um, then we have Tara Leniston, mm -hmm. and both of them are authors and co-authors. We've got right. stacks of books on our on our tables that we're going to be right. going over with you guys. Coming home to autism: a room by room approach to supporting your child at home after ASD diagnosis. That's the Tara Leniston right. and Rianne Grounds. And then Kara Dunn Barone um, sent us two books. I love, like I've seen you use this before. Yes, the incredible five point scale, which we do use in our home for showing different levels of emotion. And then the When My Worries Get Too Big book. It's for children with who live with anxiety. Yeah, so. well, but really. Don't we all? <laughs> I'm like, for children, I can hear parents are like, wait a minute, what? what's the name of that book again? When, when My, my worries, worries Get, get too, too Big. big. That's relatable. I mean, come on, that's all of us, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so they're both going to be with us a little bit later on in the show in separate interviews. Mm -hmm. But before that, we have some in the news. And I swear to goodness, it was like a salad grinder in here. I, I mixed everything up. So what do you want to start with, Miss Nancy? Well, there's a very odd story about... Uh, out of England, out of the Sun newspaper, yes. I believe, that up to 150 autistic children could have been given sex change drugs on NHS despite not being transgender. Yeah, this is a little, and again, it's being reported in the Sun. We don't know the veracity of this, and it's a little controversial, um, but apparently there are groups that are disputing here, but... Um, there are a lot of children now that are identifying themselves as transgender in yes. the world. And there are medicines that are given to them to stop puberty. Right. Because what they're seeing is if someone is transgender, that in their mind and their, uh, their body is not the right sex for how they identify in their mind, if they go through puberty, the things that they're going to have to go through, the surgeries they're going to have to go through are so much more extensive. Mm -hmm. And there are some things you can't reverse. Right. Like if there is a boy that feels that inside that he is a girl and he grows an Adam's mm -hmm. apple, you can't reverse that. Right, right. Um, so there, and it's very controversial, a lot of people on both sides thinking whether this is appropriate or not, because this is asking a young kid and, but adults who have been through this have said, believe me, I knew when I was four, mm -hmm. I was five. But apparently, it's being reported that these individuals who are on the spectrum are saying that they think that they're another sex and they're going ahead and giving them the drug. Right. And the concern is, does a person on the spectrum... Really know. Are they able to identify? Exactly. Because what happens if they get to adulthood and go, oopsie, that isn't really... Um, and if you think about it, that's a much deeper question. And I don't know how I feel about just the hypothetical of this because to automatically assume that because a person has autism that they can't, and believe me, there are people on the autism spectrum that are transgender, mm -hmm. right? And to assume that they don't know what's happening to themselves just right. because they have autism is very scary, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know that I like that, but to chemically alter someone, I mean, it's a very dicey thing, yes. either way you look at yeah, it. It says one third of those referred to London's Tavistock Clinic have saw strong signs of autism. The Mail on Sunday reports the drugs which stop the body maturing are seen by many experts as the first step to changing sex. Now, I don't know how, why all of these children with signs of autism ended up at this clinic. Well, they were referred, and and I think the question is here, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the mm -hmm. egg? You know, have they been been identified as being on the autism spectrum? Um, you know, have they had? You know, has somebody looked at it from that perspective mm -hmm. and and said, you know, here's what's happening with the autism? I, you know, it's the Sun did this report, but it's not very extensive. No, but it certainly raises some more questions. And again, we're just reporting what they wrote in the Sun. Right. Um, but it's it's a very interesting uh, dilemma, mm -hmm. and certainly a lot of people from the transgender community are up in arms about it, saying you can't. Uh, you can't just legislate that they can't get these drugs. Right. Uh, well, I will look forward to hearing from some of the families because it would seem that the parents are saying okay to this. Yeah. So 
very, very interesting. Um, okay. Then, then there's a study out of the uh, University of Utah about a researcher that went straight to the kids to see what they wanted their future to look like as adults. Yeah. So uh, she interviewed 27 students, University of Utah assistant professor Ann Kirby, and um, so much research she said about is about people on the autism spectrum, but it's not with them. So it's not talking to them, it's not hearing their own voices and ideas. And so she went directly to the kids who expressed some of their concerns and worries. And it's very interesting what they have to say about it. Um, and I do, there, there's this huge movement right now um, that we've reported here. Of course, there's the nothing about us without us, but making sure that that extends to research mm -hmm. um, is a very important topic that I think we all need to embrace. And even though I would hope that for all of us as parents that we're at some point talking to our kids about, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up and what are you afraid when you grow up, let's be honest that if our kids have the ability to communicate when they get to be a certain age, they're not necessarily going to run to us. I don't know about you, but that's devastating mm -hmm, to me mm -hmm. to think I want to be the person that my son feels comfortable coming and talking to, but that isn't always the case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, and I and I think that's true across the board with autism, without autism, and how wonderful that she set up this circumstance, which opens a dialogue for all of us asking um, these teenagers what they were worried yeah, about. Yeah, what their dreams and fears are. Yeah, um, really uh, amazing story. And of course, uh, you guys can check that out. It's again, the University of Utah, uh, fascinating. And then the last one's a feel good one. I love this. Um, you know, when we're trying to teach people things, mm -hmm. it's important, we talk about this in ABA all the time, that you have to use things that are reinforcing. Right. So uh, there's a mom who got very savvy to the fact that her son is really into pop icons. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sarah Jane Cox said that she built her entire homeschool curriculum for her son around those musical idols. I love this quote that she said, if you were to say, we've got four oranges, and six oranges, how many have we got that his her son wouldn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. But instead, if she said to him, Madonna's on stage, she's got several dancers to the side and several dancers to the other side of him. Now, how many answers, uh, how many dancers do we have that he can come up He'd with the answer? He'd be able to do it, right. But it, I mean, how powerful is that? Knowing yeah, what's reinforcing for your taking kids. Taking your child's strengths and teaching them that way. So it yeah. might be a good clue to teaching other kids as well. Yes. I mean, eventually you've got to be able to transfer that to things that they don't want mm -hmm. to. But in, um, in the world of autism, the, um, they talk about high P. Uh -huh. High P is a highly preferred thing. And when the highly preferred thing is being offered or when it's involved in the thing, you're more likely to get more right. success. Right. So we, we talk here on the show, we rarely talk about high P because it's just one of those terms that only you know, clinicians use. But we talk about doing a preference assessment um, and it doesn't matter the ability of the individual or the age, you can do a preference assessment with anyone to see what it is that they mm -hmm, want. Mm -hmm. You can do it with a very little baby mm -hmm. that is nonverbal, um, but knowing what somebody wants and that they're into is like the key to get, get the learning jump started. Right, so I right. love the fact that this mom uh, did this. Uh, really, really amazing. The Taylor, the title is Taylor Swift uh, Autism: How Taylor Swift Helps Fletcher Eight mm -hmm. Learn. <laughs> I'm sure she loves seeing that today too. Okay, so we got these two amazing gifts, and we sort of Hi. teased what the what the books are. Yes. And I think we're having um, Carrie first. Right. Are we not? So we'll yes. find out about when my worries get too big and the incredible five point scale. I'm ready for All that. Right, we'll be back. Stick soon. with us. at the Future Horizons uh, Super Conference in Dallas, Texas. It helped me in a way because it was a format that I was not used to. Like, I had never curled my hair before. I've never worn heels. I didn't know what foundation was. And it was just, uh, it was a very, like, it helped me more in a business sense. Like, I know how to present myself in front of people now. That's, that's something my mom drilled into my head. Um, I have trouble sometimes with it. Like, 
you introduced yourself to me downstairs, and so I immediately like, and I've heard of you before, so I was like, I know this person, I can make eye contact with this person. And um, if I'm talking to someone I don't know, or if I'm listening to someone give a speech, most of the time my head will be down. I don't look at people in the eye, but if it's someone I know I need to make eye contact with, I make eye contact. But my mom growing up, she, uh, especially after the diagnosis, she would always like grab my hand if I was like, you know, looking everywhere else, but oh, and she'd like say, look me in the eye. And so she wouldn't let go of my hand until I looked her in the eye. I do feel like I have to do play poet because, you know, sometimes there'll be jokes I don't understand, but I'll laugh at anyway. Uh, there'll be, uh, situations that I'm not comfortable with, but I'm going to have to play along anyway. And uh, I, th I think I just found out, like, I'm just a tremendously amazing liar. <laughs> like, I can pretend like I'm uncomfortable with something when in actuality I am screaming inside, or I'm, I know the moment I get back to my dorm room, I'm going to start screaming, or uh, having a meltdown or something like that. But I also know that there is a time and a place, because uh, there isn't any safe rooms uh, available uh, in neurotypical society, like we have to make our own, and uh, you know, on a college campus, there's not many places you can go and scream without attracting attention. The way I explain it to people is, uh, you know, people's brains like hamster wheels. Eventually, the hamster's got to take a break. Um, autistic brains aren't like that; they just keep going and going and going. So we can't stop thinking about things. Those like. That's why a lot of kids with autism have sleep problems, because they can't fall asleep because they have too much on their brain. They, they can't sleep because they're thinking too much. And um, I think just the walking in circles, there's no thought to a circle. Like, it's just, like, so I'll just plug in my earphones so I can't hear anything else except whatever white noise I'm listening to, and I'll just walk in a circle. I think it's just like we are just as prevalent as men with autism. There might not be as many as, as uh, there are boys, but um, we are still part of this movement. We're still part of this community, and we just got to be remind people that hey, you know, we're here too. You know, don't forget about us. Uh, one thing I've learned is that um, first off, I'm not the only person who. Uh, is speaking from their own perspective. Like, I feel like I go to some of these conferences and it's a bunch of doctors and a bunch of parents who want to talk and get to know what autism is about, but there's not a lot of people on the spectrum talking about it. And so I come to these and I see Temple Grandin, who's one of the biggest faces in the autism community, actually get up and talk about what helped her and what we need to do to, in order to get our kids part of society and not in our pa uh, parents' basements. And so it's it just kind of reaffirmed me like, I'm not the only one. Thank you. Because <laughs> I'd go to these and I would be the only one. I'd be next to a bunch of doctors and talking about worlds I have not even seen before, let alone pronounce. And I'm just sitting here like, I did a pageant once. <laughs> so it's good to know like I'm speaking from a perspective of uh, not necessarily overcoming, but learning to live with uh, this. Because I feel like not a lot of people come out and say, what it's like to live on the autism spectrum. Um, a lot of people talk about their struggles and everything like that, but they don't talk about, you know, what they've done to uh, make their lives better uh, while living on the spectrum. And we're back with Let's Talk Autism, and now we're joined by Carrie Dunn. Is it Buran? Buran. Mm -hmm. Buran. Buran. Okay, Buran. And Carrie Dunn Baran has taught uh, kindergarten through 12 with students on the autism spectrum for 30 plus years, was a founding member of the Minnesota Autism Project. She has developed an autism spectrum disorder certificate program for educators at Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, her accomplishments go on and on, but she's here today as the co-author of the five point scale the incredible five-point scale, and the author of When My Worries Get Too Big, um, which is designed for kids. So we're going to be talking to her about both of those books. Uh, welcome to the show, Carrie. Thank you very much. It's thrilled to have you here. So um, the incredible five-point scale, which I'm just going to point out, most of the rim of it is green, you guys. That's why 
it at see through because we clear, shoot on yes. a green screen. Uh, <laughs> but so uh, this you it's a system that you developed with your colleague Bitsy Curtis. Can you tell us what ideas and research contributed to the development of the five point scale? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, the idea is that we were looking at um, the traditional or the most common autism learning styles, um, such as the vis using visuals um, to learn, not being a, a learning strength, uh, whereas a lot of auditory input and language concepts seem to be less of a strength. And Simon Baron Cohen from Cambridge University uh, developed a learning theory that he called hypersystemizing and hypo emotionalizing. And by that he meant that most individuals with, on the autism spectrum seem to learn best through systems and had more difficulty learning through um, emotional language. So, what we started doing was taking um, social and emotional concepts that we were trying to teach and put them on a scale. So everything got broken into five parts, whether it was voice volume or um, stress, um, uh, personal distance, um, language, uh, swearing, um, that kind of thing. So no matter what it was, we could just take that concept, that idea, and break it into five parts. So we're teaching social and emotional um, concepts and ideas to people who otherwise have difficulty grasping them or understanding. Um, yeah, so that was it. And we started with the uh, voice scale, um, trying to teach a middle school boy uh, that in the hallway while passing, you needed to use number three voice. Rather than telling him he was too loud, or he needed to talk softer, those felt very judging to him and he responded poorly to those prompts. So instead, we found that if we reviewed a, a voice volume scale prior to going out to uh, passing in the hallway, uh, and he clearly understood that the hallway was a number three, then all we had to do was either hold up a number three or um, prompt him that, um, he needed to bring it down to a three. And when you realized how well this worked, you had to have been really excited. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> In the first edition of the book, I know I read, I wrote that we started thinking that everything, every problem in the world could be solved via a five-point scale. So in the <laughs> beginning, it just was, it was overwhelming. It worked so well and so fast. Uh, we started making scales for the teachers that we were working with at the time and through uh, and to, for other school districts. And so we finally decided to write a book about it so we could hand them something. Okay. Well, Tell us how the five-point scale differs from behavior management tools. Um, yeah. A, traditional behavior management tools usually look at um, what to do and what not to do. And um, this is really more of, and actually happened after the fact in most cases. So you earn, a, uh, you earn a, a jelly bean, or you lose a jelly bean, or you earn a token, or a smiley face. So even positive behavior management, positive reinforcement is, is really different. This is a cognitive behavioral approach to teaching. And it is all about teaching, teaching, um, teaching, uh, social and emotional concepts in a very direct and highly systematic way. Um, if somebody has explosive behavior, has problems or, with their emotional regulation, and with a minor disappointment completely falls apart, in a traditional behavioral system, um, I might try to use some sort of motivation to get this person to control those emotions. The five point scale really looks at uh, the idea that skills can be taught and that something like emotional regulation is a skill. And that's, that's been pretty well uh, documented in recent 
cognitive neuroscience. So uh, emotional regulation as a skill can be taught. So you take a skill like um, voice volume, a simple skill like that, and rather than give the uh, boy in the hallway um, a, a token for using the right voice volume in the hallway, I'm focusing my attention on on teaching him how to recognize his own voice volume and adjusting based on the number scale of the environment, if that makes sense. Right. And this can also be, be used in the home. There's an example in the book, The Incredible Home Scale. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. The, the Incredible Home Scale um, was a scale written for a young girl who um, oftentimes uh, lost emotional control when they were visiting her grandparents or uh, family members or friends. And so the recommendation was to try to teach her through the use of a five-point scale. And uh, the one in this case was, I can handle this. I'm fine. So that, if that's how she's feeling, she would be at a number one. Um, I'm feeling a little bit nervous. That was a number two. Please don't talk to me. That was a number three. Um, I need some space. And that was number four. And I need to leave. And that was number five. So in working with mom uh, on using this scale with her daughter, um, we talked about the importance of the, uh, validating her daughter's ratings. So even if she was having mom was having the best time ever, if her daughter rated herself at a four, she needed to wrap it up and assume that she was pushing her daughter beyond her daughter's ability to control her emotions and she was going to lose control uh, if they didn't leave. And it worked really, really well. Um, they, uh, the, her daughter uh, ended up being able to check in with her mom and they would check in throughout the visit. So if they were there for Thanksgiving dinner or if they were there for uh, some other uh, visit social reason, she would have her daughter check in with her on um, an hourly basis so that she could say, okay, how, where are you? What, what number are you at right now? So that she could proactively kind of um, intervene and make a, make a good decision before, before uh, her daughter lost control. It's, it's yeah. really amazing. And what I love about it is that once you teach this five point to an individual, then you can apply it to so many other things and you right. don't have to reteach the concept. They get it at that point. Let's talk a little bit now about the when my worries get too big and what your hopes are for this book uh, in the hands of teachers and parents. Okay. Um, that, that is taking the scale, the book is taking the scale and putting it into story form um, and language that would be um, appropriate for children. Uh, it was actually written for a boy named Nicholas when he was five years old. Nicholas is now an adult. Um, but when he was five years old, he was pretty close to school phobia. He had gotten, uh, he had such high levels of anxiety. And we were working on relaxation. I was working with an occupational therapist on relaxation. And we were working on the, actually the five point scale anxiety, the anxiety scale. I think I might have given you one of those as well, um, where it's just one is I'm, um, I can handle this and a five is I'm gonna fall apart. We have a picture of that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. There we go. Okay, so it's up on we the screen right now. now. Okay, we were working on that <clears throat> scale. Um, but he was only five years old, and he loved to write stories as just an activity that we would do with him. So what um, I decided to do was write a story about the five-point scale and anxiety. And at that time, there was a program, a cognitive behavioral program, I think it was out of Yale. The, the author's name was John Marsh, and it was called How I Ran OCD Off My Land. <laughs> and the whole idea was he was taking um, OCD and putting it into 
part and parcel of this person. So it wasn't that this OCD was this separate piece. It was part a part of this person's personality and who he was, um, and it was written for children. And yet sometimes that OCD got just in the way and he had to run it off his land. He had to um, work really hard to overcome. So I started thinking about that and put anxiety into that um, into that equation. And using the same kind of cognitive behavioral approach, uh, helping Nicholas understand that the autism uh, or the worries were all, th that was part of who he was. And that wasn't a bad thing. And w with it came some, some pretty amazing strengths. Um, but every now and then, that, uh, those worries would just get too big for him to manage. And that's what he needed to fight back. Um, and he learned what we called a calming sequence. And a calming sequence was just a, uh, just a series of um, actions. I think his was rub head, rub legs, squeeze hands. It's um, it, for every child, it can be a little bit different because mm -hmm. whatever is calming to them, whatever movement. Yes, I think for him, you have taking deep breaths, you know, putting his hands together and pressing his hands together. I'm looking at the book now. Yeah. Okay. So he, uh, we gave him that sequence, and the sequence right. is really based on the research in the area of autism, or not autism, excuse me, anxiety, uh, which shows that um, when you are, when somebody is highly anxious, their brain really does prefer a very predictable, overlearned sort of sequence. And you can think about this as, um, for instance, training to be um, a, a firefighter. They repeat the same things, or a police officer, a first responder of any kind, because it's highly stressful. Um, they, re they practice all the different possibilities and what the response could be. To lessen the idea that they even have to think when they approach that level of stress, um, that the brain really doesn't do well when it's highly anxious. So the idea is that when Nicholas was beginning to feel anxious, he could close his eyes, take a deep breath, rub his legs, squeeze his hands, take another deep breath, and open his eyes. And we would practice that over and over and over and over again so that it became second nature, kind of like a gymnast's routine. You know, a, a, a gymnast doesn't do this skill, this skill, this skill. It really has to be practiced so many times that it becomes a fluid motion. And for this situation, it's really was, we were going for the same idea, that I wanted Nicholas to become, to overlearn this relaxation uh, sequence so that when he was faced with anything that might be disturbing, he could close his eyes, take a deep breath, rub his legs, squeeze his hands, take another deep breath, and open his eyes. So it was um, allowing him to uh, learn this sort of uh, a trick for him to use to lower his anxiety, to lower his body's anxiety. But at first he needed to learn to identify the different feelings in his body. And so we used the scale to sort of look at what does a one feel like, you know, when you're really happy, how does that feel? When you're getting a little nervous, how does that feel? And uh, when you've lost control, what is, you know, what does that feel like? And what kinds of things make you feel this way? And every child is a little bit different. So the book is really, um, it's left open uh, for kids to list the things that make them feel really good mm -hmm. and the things make them really upset. Um, the, the story itself, it uses a lot of simple emotion words to help children understand the language of emotion, which is another way of learning how to regulate your emotions. You're looking at emotional regulation um, and teaching the skill of emotional regulation, teaching the language involved with understanding emotion is a uh, is a first step so um 
after the book has been read, then reading the book repetitively over time is a really good idea. And then if there are any predictably nerve-wracking things that your child faces, whether it's uh, going to church or the grocery store or uh, an, uh, to a family member's Thanksgiving dinner, um, you would then read the story before going and maybe make a little five-point scale, little, tra little uh, business card size five-point scale to take with him, put, him, put in his pocket, um, look at it when he's, when he's starting to feel um, anxious to read him of the story. I, yeah. This is just so lovely. Uh, there's yeah. there's an example, though, that you use when talking to people about uh, this whole idea of taking your emotions, accepting that they're a part of you, but not getting overwhelmed by them, that has to do with Harry Potter. Tell us a little bit about that, because I think it's genius, a way to explain it to kids. And I said this? <laughs> yes. It's the whole thing about um, having a, a, a pestilence, isn't it? The, the Dumbledore has the thing where... Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, well, sorry. Uh, <laughs> that, yes, that uh, Dumbledore had kept all his memories, and of course he lived for, what, hundreds of years? So um, sometimes the stress of having so many memories got to him, and he would have to empty his memories into... Um, now, because you've asked me, I'm going to forget the name of it. It's like a pestilence. A, it's something... A pensive? A pensive. Yes, That's what it pensive. is. Thank you. So um, the, uh, the pensive is, is this big vat, and that's where he uh, empties all of his um, all of his memories. And we and oftentimes would have a worry box at school or at camp. Um, I used to run a camp for kids as well, and... It would, the idea would be to either write it down or even just think about it and put the card um, into the worry box. Um, that actually, one of my campers found uh, an app uh, on his iPad that's a shredder. I don't know if people are familiar with it, but you can type in a word, for instance, homework. And then you can drag the homework over to the shredder and the, it, the little machine shreds the word i love it it's it's, it's along the same lines though the visual of sort of getting rid of your worries by uh, funneling them into the pensive i love using the example from harry potter because i do think kids will get it uh, saying take your troubles and mm -hmm. put them aside you know that's very like ah, i don't know how to do that right but that, that they have a visual of dumbledore being able to put his troubles Mm -hmm. In that, I think that's a really exciting thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're almost out of time here, but where can we get these and where can teachers get these books? Um, they're available on the Autism Asperger Publishing Company's website. Um, do you have that? Uh, yes, have Samantha's. That? Well, um, Samantha's got a, 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 a place where the they five point scale dot com. That one, that's my website. Okay. And I, I don't I don't handle any of the merchandise, so uh, but you can click on a book on my website and it'll take you okay. to the publisher's website. So that'll work. And I've got the publisher's website right here, www.aapcpublishing.net. pcpublishing.net. Uh, and really, honestly, as we get ready to go back to school, for those of you who want to give a gift to your teacher right. as they're starting the school year, uh, you know, get both of these. Do, be going through the when my worries get too big with your child mm -hmm. leading up to school, but get the other one and give it to your teacher as a gift. Because these are great. A lot of our kids have anxiety about going back to school. So Yes. Or we'll just yeah. have anxiety. As somebody who has anxiety and has had to go through cognitive behavioral therapy, I think that these are really amazing and so useful. So thank you for all the work that you guys have done yes, and all the you, help Carrie. it's providing. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. All right. You take, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
wonderful. Okay. I know. Um, I, I can use this book for myself. I mean, it's, Oh, we all could. Right. I mean, honestly, if you have a friend, there's always a workbook that mm -hmm. was given to me first when I went to cognitive behavioral therapy right. that I recommend and have bought some and given them to friends okay. from time to time. But it's like, you know, I always tell them, don't bother reading everything. Just do some of the exercises mm -hmm. in it. And even that mm -hmm. is anxiety causing. Right. This is better. Mm -hmm. It's simple. <laughs> simple. Maybe designed for children, but it can be helpful to all yeah, of us. And this really does the same thing. It's yeah. all about understanding that what the process that your body is going through mm -hmm. is okay. And, and, and that what you say to yourself, first you have to acknowledge where you are and then what you say to yourself is really what's key. Right. And that there are things that you can do to calm yourself down. Yeah, that's all in here. It's all in here. So that's there you go. for the kids. Fabulous. Okay. All right, we're and gonna we, take a break. Yeah, we come, we're coming back with Tara Liniston, who wrote the book Coming Home to Autism, co-wrote the book. And we're gonna find out a little bit about that uh, book, which has some great tips about autism uh, just for all parents and for things within your home that yeah, you can do. Yeah, setting up your house to, right. to work with you, not against yes, you. Yes, right. Oh, well. So we'll be back soon. That's a good thing. Stick with us. Hi, this is Lisa Ackerman. Welcome back to Talk of Facts. Frequently Asked Questions and Answers for the Autism Journey. Now, this one is specifically for teens and adults with autism. I get this question all the time. What's new and exciting in the medical world uh, today for teens and adults with autism. So let's talk about them. TMS, Transmagnetic Stimulation Therapy, is something that is really exciting. Um, I met with the author, John Robeson, look me in the eye. He's a, a gentleman with Asperger's and something I hope all of our kids to strive and grow up and be just like him. He's amazing. He talked about TMS therapy and how he became more social, aware. His smile was more natural and I definitely can better understand things around him in those social settings. Another really great treatment um, that we're seeing just a ton of research on in the last three years is cerebral folate autoimmunity. You know, in the 90s, they started putting folate in all of our different foods and products. Well, some people they have found out, and specifically a high percentage of children with autism, don't process folate like what, how they should. Go figure, they don't do it the way the books say it's gonna happen. So cerebral folate autoimmunity is just a really exciting new therapeutic to work with your physician on and to look to see if your child is a candidate for that therapy. And another common thing that we're seeing in teens and adults, and we've talked about it before in Talk of Facts, is seizures. Very serious issue that needs to be looked at. Um, abnormal brain waves or brain patterns or epileptic activity in the brain definitely needs to be addressed in children with autism. Again, I'm not a doctor, but I know doctors that can go through and work and look at the, the child and perform a 24-hour EG. What they're finding with some of these anticonvulsant or seizure medications is kids start to make great gains in speech, cognition, sleep, learning, by treating any type of seizure activity. So, and the other issue is pandas, not the cute fuzzy bears that we see in the zoo, uh, but an issue that is happening with a lot of teens and adults on the spectrum, where you see a dramatic change in behaviors um, with these individuals, and often they have an inappropriate immune response. Taka has a great white paper, so you can go look up in the pandas definition, what to test and treat for and talk to your doctor about, but know that if you see an extreme swing in behavior with a child um, that goes from one place to a very negative place, we're seeing a lot of uh, teens positively responding to treatments for pandas. Uh, and the last tr treatment I wanted to talk about, um, and I'm super excited about, and this happens to not just work with younger kids on the autism spectrum, but also older children on the spectrum, teens and adults, it's called mendability. Um, and a great study just came out of UCI in May 2013 about a multi-sensory approach uh, for individuals with autism. The whole premise behind the therapy uh, is very simple, making it a sensory rich environment so neural connections can make new pathways or at least connect in that individual. So kids with sensory issues, uh, auditory listening issues, uh, speech issues, they seem to really just respond to mendability, and uh, I was so excited to see that new research. 
more research is being done on it. And the beautiful, beautiful part about mendability is it's something parents can do on their own, administer with their child, and be uh, connected to their kid as partners in the autism journey. Don't forget in any therapy or medical intervention to work with your physician and to do proper testing to know what your child needs and what treatments to pursue under a physician's care. So there's so many new things I could go on for hours about new treatments and excitement, but there's the top ones that just have me so geeked here. But that's another talk of fact. Thanks for joining me, and we'll see you next time and on Real Journey, Real Questions and Answers to help your autism journey. Welcome back. We have our next guest. So excited to have her join us via Skype. Tara Leniston is joining us. She may look familiar to you because she was an actress and performed in films and on television. She's originally from Ireland, but has lived all over the world. In fact, did a lot of acting uh, through an, the Jackie Chan agency out of Hong Kong. Uh, but when she had her child and it was uh, one of her children was diagnosed on the spectrum, things kind of took a left turn for her, like it does for so many of us. And together with Rianne Grounds, who is a speech therapist uh, a very, with extensive background with autism, they have written a book, Coming Home to Autism. The subtitle is A Room-by-Room -room Approach to Supporting Your Child at Home After ASD Diagnosis. Both of these women are huge advocates for families and individuals on the autism spectrum, trying to help them to reach their fullest potential and to be successful mm -hmm. in the home and in all kinds of places. Right. This is a really uh, exciting book put together in a very different way, which we're going to talk to her about. Yeah. So Tara, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Excited very to good. have, how have are you here. What inspired you to write the book, Tara? Dylan. My son, okay. he inspired me um, mostly. But when Dylan first got diagnosed, mm -hmm. I wanted to research everything I could and try and find as much information as I could about him. And all the books I seemed to read were either really medically um, speaking, and it took me a year to read them, or they were someone else's journey. And like you both know, you have children on the spectrum, everyone's journey is different. You can talk to 10 different people, 100 people, and everyone's journey is different. So that didn't help me. So what I wanted was a book like myself and Rian wrote, which was you know, very easy to read, and you didn't have to read, you don't have to read the whole book to get the answer that you want. So if you want to know about how to potty train your child who's on the spectrum, you go to the bathroom section, or to sleep through the night, you go to the bedroom section. So you don't have to, you know, read the whole book to get the answer that you want. Right. And so often people, you know, will put together, we see all the time on the show, moms will write a history of what happened to them and their mm -hmm. child, mm -hmm. right? A memoir. Other times people will do you know, books about how to teach individual things. But this is the first time that I ever recall somebody taking an, and giving a really useful tip book, but taking it room by room mm -hmm. and thinking of it in that way. What I want to know is how did that come about? How, what made you guys realize, you know, that's the way it's structured in our heads, so that's the way we're going to write it in the book? Um. I'm not sure really. I kind of had the book in my head four years before I actually wrote it. And I think, you know, home is a really important place for everyone and it's our, our safe haven from the world. And what I found is that when I would go to meetings of autism mums and I would go to, you know, play groups and I'd talk to speech therapists, I always felt really encouraged. But then I would come home and Dylan would have a meltdown or he wasn't sleeping through the night and I felt very alone in that time and um, myself and my husband we had you know we separated for a year and we found it very difficult we were arguing and I just felt that home wasn't the safe haven that I wanted so I spent a long time trying to find you know the right textures for Dylan the right smells for Dylan in the house um, to make a safe haven to make our home a safe haven as opposed to being outside, being easy, and coming home and it being disastrous. Right. So you take a lot of your personal experiences, like the fact that Dylan wasn't sleeping through the night, and then you apply that with some practical information, such as giving routines for parents of how they can deal with that problem. Yes. Yeah, and a routine is just it's the key for everything. You know, it's what makes our home 
safe and comfortable because Dylan feels in control of this environment. He doesn't control us as such, but he knows that breakfast is at the same time, bedtime is the same time every night. We develop this bedtime routine that worked for us. Um, you know, his happy spray, which gets rid of all those bad thoughts, anxiety, which basically just like a pillow spray. But uh, for him, it works. Okay. And and how, now that you, and you're sharing these wonderful tips, and they are wonderful tips, talk to us a little bit about, as you did these things, how it changed your relationship with your husband, and, and how the house ran differently as a result of these changes. Well, in the beginning, our house was just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a nice place to be, because we were arguing, we were sleep deprived, we didn't understand what we were doing with Dylan, and we just spent a long time you know, talking, getting to know each other again, listening to each other again. And like I said, I spent many years trying to find the best, you know, possible sensory environment for Dylan. So our house is, you know, sensory haven for him. We have a little playroom, which I talk about in the book as well, which could be like a little tent with his sensory toys in it. And that helped him. And soon things started to calm down and Dylan started to calm down and home is his safe haven now. And, you know, if you came in, sat and had tea with me, you probably wouldn't even know Dylan was on the spectrum because he's so comfortable in his environment and he's learned to control his environment that his behavior settles down a lot. Well, what are some easy tips? Uh, we want people to get the book. I mean, because the book is a treasure trove of, of fabulous tips and hints of things to be able to do. But give us like one or two of your top tips that you think could help parents in their home today. Routine. Routine, you know, having a routine for your child is probably the most important thing you can do. Visuals, having a visual timetable so they know what's happening in the day. Um, so the night before, I'll run through, you know, a step-by-step -step guide for Dylan, you know, and it can change. And now he's older, I'll say to him, oh, Dylan, you know number five on the list? That's changed because we've got a flat tire and we just, I have a little whiteboard that I carry in my bag with me with a bag, with a pen, and we just change the, the one to 10 of the day. So routine, visuals, I mean, they're really my top tips for, for helping a child on the spectrum and helping your life in general. I love it. And how old is Dylan now? He's eight. Wonderful. Okay. And, and sounds like he's doing really well. He is doing really well. You know, he, when he got diagnosed, he got diagnosed with severe autism and we were lucky enough that we, we got him diagnosed 18 months um, with early intervention and you know specialist nursery setting he went into a, a specialist autistic school um, but unfortunately he was in a class full of non-verbal children and Dylan started to become a little bit more verbal and he really craved friendships so we moved him to a mainstream school which he's in now with he's with full-time one-to-one support but you know he's very much part of the school environment and you know our, our village so it's really nice. And how did you and Rianne come to work together? Um, Rianne and I met when Dylan was just diagnosed. She was working in speech therapy in the area that I was in, and we, we, you know, she is so very passionate about um, children on the spectrum, and she had so much advice to give me. I remember going to her asking how, you know, would I potty train Dylan, or how would I do this? And she's just, she's a wealth of knowledge, and she helped me through some of the most difficult and darkest days that I've had. And so when I got the idea of writing Coming Home to Autism, I really wanted to make sure that I could help all families with a child on the spectrum. And obviously I know Dylan and Dylan is verbal, but there are many children who are on the spectrum who are not verbal and Rian is able to access them as well. She knew more about that than I did. So coming together, we thought the book would help, you know, a whole range of families, not just children like Dylan. Yes, yeah, she adds in each chapter a section by Rianne, is that correct? Yes, she does. Okay. It's a powerful so, partnership and a lovely, lovely book. Where can people get it? Um, you can buy it on Amazon. I know you can buy it on Amazon over in the States as well, or from Jessica Kingsley Publishing. And it's in, I think it's coming to a few bookshops in America too. I'm going to be coming over probably next year and doing a bit of a, a book tour over there as well. Okay, great. Fabulous. If Coming you're home LA, to autism, a room-by-room yeah. -room approach to supporting your child at home after ASD diagnosis by Tara Liniston and Rian Grounds. And if you're in the LA area when you're touring, come and let us know. We'll have you in the yeah, studio. Yeah, we'll have you in the studio. We'll have you come over. Oh, thank you so much. I'd love to meet you both. Okay, it would be lovely. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank, thank you, you so Tara. much.
Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, really wonderful. So check that out. Um, and that is Jessica Kingsley uh, Publishers. Right. Okay. Wonderful. All right, let's take a break. Right. And we'll be back to okay. close out the show. Stick with us. Can you say hello? Say hello. AJ? Stop crying. <laughs> AJ, let's eat. Can you eat, AJ? Let's eat, son. Have a fry. My understanding of autism was very limited. <laughs> on cars, windows, you, you name it. And so we went to the 13 month checkup and I remember our pediatrician, he said, well, he probably has autism. There's nothing you can do about it. Come back in a year when he's three. Our initial understanding of what the ABA program was was basically all we picked up from this clinic in San Antonio. He didn't pick up any signs the entire eight months that he was there. I think the difference came when we changed vendors. We were very impressed with the way that CARD actually gathered data to be able to quantify the progress that he was making. They have a curriculum that they follow that's tailored to each child. They were identifying AJ's strengths and weaknesses. We were finally starting to see real progress. What, AJ? Where's X? The first thing CARD did for us was I remember the first time AJ said, Mommy, I want you. And that was the most wonderful thing ever. There's, so, there's hope. Yeah, there's That's when I knew that there was hope. I never thought that AJ would be able to say that. It was like a gift from God. It was so fantastic. With CARD, we got him enrolled in a private school. And he was in a typical classroom. He would go from activity to activity. He could sit when he was supposed to sit. He could be around typical kids. The goal is for CARD to work themselves out of a job. It's for AJ to be in a mainstream classroom with no help, and he's functional and he's learning. We're really grateful to all of the therapists. AJ would not be where he is without them, and we will never be able to repay the part of themselves that they gave to him to make his life better and to make our lives better. And you were just describing to me, you have a guest on tomorrow. Yes, I'm very excited. Yeah. Judith Feldman is going to be on tomorrow. And we've never had her on the show before, which is bizarre to me. Because um, we've had her son on the show and who before. who is her son? Her son is known as the rapper Soul Shaka. Uh -huh. Rio Wiles is his name. But he, his, uh, he goes by Soul Shaka. He performs uh, pretty much any autism event we go to. They have booked Soul Shaka mm -hmm. there. And he gets up and does rap. And he gets the audience riled. And the stuff that he says when he's rapping is, it's pretty amazing. You've seen him perform, haven't I've you? I've seen him perform once, it's, yeah. It's, he, like, I don't know. I have gotten to know him a little bit, and he is one of the most lovely, gentle souls that there is. But at first glance, you look at him and you go, oh, it's a rapper, right? Right. right. Like, because he dresses and looks like a rapper mm -hmm. and whatever. Then you then you find out that he's on the spectrum. And I think a lot of times, I'm going to cop to this myself, you you know, it's like, oh, I don't know where he is on the spectrum, so I don't know what he's capable of. And maybe in an initial conversation with him, it would be easy to miss the huge intelligence that mm -hmm. is there mm -hmm. and the fact that he can improvise and talk about things that are political or just social right. in a huge way on stage with thousands of people watching. Mm -hmm. He's brilliantly talented. Okay. Let's just say that. Um, and I have known his parents through being at events and little things, little little sort of hiccupy things that happen. Right. Like one of the performances that I was at when it was the um, Temple Grandin and Friends, it was at the no the it was it the Nokia, Nokia? yeah. Uh -huh. And I had to leave to go out to get something, and I had a press pass. And his dad was outside trying to get in with a tripod because they wanted to film. Um, 
Solshock as performance and they weren't letting him in with the tripod. Right. They were like, no, tripods are not allowed. You know, right. it's that kind right. of, that right. rule stuff that makes me crazy. And I didn't know who he was, okay. but he was standing there saying, but I'm just trying to get in there to do the thing. And they said, nope, you can't come in. And he stepped back and I walked through and I said, give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and and he was like, "What? Who are you?" And I said, "I, you know, I don't know who you are either, but give it to me. I have a press pass. I'll walk in with it. Just meet me inside." And we didn't know each other or anything. So that but was the dad, though. That was the dad, but and, mom was there too. Okay. But so we kind of connected then, had connected several times over different things. Um, but and then, you know, mom had said to me, you know, had I read her book? Uh -huh. I didn't know she had a book. And it's and called the it's myth. It's called the myth. And this book has been kicking Mike Easter 68 ways from Sunday. Um, it, it, I, so you it's were asking, very philosophical and... Well, it's very metaphysical. metaphysical. She's a very sp spiritual person. And it's not, it's not just a memoir about her and her son. Like, like the first half of the book, you sort of dive in and you're living the world through her eyes. Mm -hmm. This very metaphysical person who receives messages from the universe and mm -hmm. says, I think I better do this. Mm -hmm. Um, and and this sort of roller coaster ride that she's going through and you and deep inner feelings that she's going through but then she starts to do some research on some myths that we all believe in about what our place is in the world I'm not even it's kicking my keister okay it sounds it is, really interesting and it's and very <laughs> spiritual and it and, and how much of it is actually about her journey with autism um you know what it's a side thing but it's mm -hmm. through the whole thing i mean it really is about her discovering herself and her place in the world but mm -hmm. also coming to acceptance about her role of the mother of a child with autism mm -hmm. it's not about that but it's it deeply woven throughout right. it right but i'm telling you um she's on the show tomorrow All right, well then i'm gonna and tune then it, in